All right, in this video, we're gonna go through the entire Unit 7 Honors Chemistry Study Guide. So number one, considering the following diagrams with two different solutes dissolved in water, which figure has a covalent compound as the solute and which is an ionic compound? Uh, and then justify your answer. So let me zoom in just a little bit more. Um, if you look at the first one, we have a solute. Okay, and it's being broken apart into positive and negative cations. Okay, so figure A would be the ionic. We know that ionics disassociate in water. That means they're broken apart. And then figure B, if you look here, it's hard to see, but in here are the compounds. Okay, and they're being surrounded by the water molecules, but they're not being brokerated, broken apart, okay? Um, since it's being dissolved, we know this is going to be a polar covalent because like dissolves like. Okay, and again, the difference is the ionic disassociates, it breaks apart when it dissolves in water, and the covalent, polar covalent, like dissolves like, so it's going to dissolve in water, but it won't disassociate into the ions. All right, next question. If the above figure had, let me zoom out just a tad here. If the above figure had carbon tetrachloride as the solvent, how would the diagrams differ and explain? Okay, so carbon tetrachloride, so that would be CCl4, let me just draw the molecule here really quick. So carbon tetrachloride is a nonpolar. Okay, so let me just make a note here, nonpolar. So since it's nonpolar, the ionic wouldn't dissolve because the ionics only dissolve in polar. And then the polar covalent, figure B, would also not dissolve because like dissolves like. Polar and nonpolar aren't the same, so neither would dissolve. And front face. Okay, considering the following diagram, explain the difference in the particles of each test tube based on the relationship between polarity and miscibility. So if you look at A, we have a distinct layer here. In B, it all looks the same. Okay, and you can even tell here, on A, we have a distinct layer in the molecular diagram, and in B, they all mix together. Okay, so in A, liquids are miscible. Oh, I'm sorry, immiscible. Meaning they don't dissolve, they don't combine. And then in B, the liquids are miscible. And then I can even put in here same polarities, so like dissolves like. Okay, B, which test tube would represent the interaction between acetone and carbon tetrachloride? Okay, so um, acetone would be a polar and I obviously don't expect you to know this off the top of your head that acetone is polar and then carbon tetrachloride CCl4 is nonpolar um, we know that like dissolves like since these are not the same polarity uh, test tube A would be the best fit. Okay, 
which test tube would represent <laughs> which test tube would represent the interaction between cyclohexane and carbon tetrachloride? Um, cyclohexane is nonpolar. And we already identified earlier, CCL4, carbon tetrachloride, is nonpolar. So um, test tube B would represent this. So if you go back up and look at test tube B, Test tube B, everything is the same all the way through. There's no distinct layers. Um, so that would be um, cyclohexane and carbon tetrachloride. All right. Use the following graph to answer questions four through eight. If 25 grams of C, or sorry, K, ClO3 were dissolved in 100 grams of water at 10 degrees Celsius, what type of solution is formed? Okay, so let's find that curve on the graph. Um, let's see, that is this curve right here. Okay, 100 grams of water. That's what we've got right here on the y-axis. Um, 10 degrees Celsius. And it's saying we dissolve 25 grams of it. So I'm going to go up and 25 grams is right there. Since we're above the curve, this is going to be super saturated. And again, the reason is our point is above the curve, so it's super saturated. All right. How much water is needed to create a saturated solution of potassium chloride using 17 grams of solute at 30 degrees? All right. So potassium chloride is this curve right here. And... We're looking for 30 degrees, so that's there. And we've already dissolved, let's see, 17 grams. Okay, so we know to make a saturated solution, if you look at the point here, it's about 35 grams. Okay. And um, that would be obviously in 100 grams of water. So the question's asking, like, if I had 17 grams of potassium chloride, how many grams of water do I need? So you would cross multiply here. I would multiply these two numbers together and then I would divide by 35. And if you do that, you get 48 grams of water. Okay, so we wanna maintain the same ratio. Um, that's why we find the saturated solution at 30 degrees. And then we just put that over or, sorry, we put the grams that we have over some unknown amount of water, and then we solve using a uh, proportion. Okay, identify the saturation point of ammonia at 70 degrees. Okay, so ammonia is oops, this curve right here. And 70 degrees. Okay, um, so, oops, nope, that's the wrong curve, ammonia, <laughs> ammonia is this curve right here. Okay, so let's go back, so ammonia, 70 degrees, looks like it's just under 20, so maybe like 18 grams at 70 degrees.
Okay, if a solution of potassium nitrate is cooled from 70 to 50 uh, degrees Celsius, how many grams of solute will crystallize? Okay, so potassium nitrate, so that is going to be this curve right here. Actually, we'll identify the correct curve this time. Um, we're going from 70 to 50. So at 70, if we go up to the curve, we have about 130. And 50, we are at 80. So all we do is subtract these. So the difference between these is 50 grams. So 50 grams will crystallize. What type of solution is formed from 62 grams of potassium nitrate at 40 degrees? Okay, potassium nitrate is uh, same solution. So 62 grams potassium nitrate at 40 degrees. So here's 40 degrees. Okay, potassium nitrate is this curve right here. Same one we were just looking at. And it says we have 62 grams. Okay, so 62 grams looks like it's right on the curve. So if you're on the curve, you're saturated. So saturated because we are on the curve. All right, moving on to molarity. Calculate the molarity of an aqueous solution formed from 2.5 moles of potassium chloride in uh, 0.5 liters. Okay, so our equation for molarity is moles over liters. So we're just going to plug in. We have 2.5 moles and 0 0.50 liters. So we just divide here. So 2.5 divided by 0.5, that's going to be 5 molar. Okay, calculate the number of moles of lead nitrate needed to form 275 milliliters of a 0.75 molar solution. Okay, so again, let's go to our molarity equation. Okay, so this time we know the molarity, so 0 0.75 molar. We don't know the number of moles, but we know 275 milliliters. That's going to be 0 0.275 liters. To solve, I would multiply both sides by 0.275 and I get an answer of 0 0.21 moles. Okay, calculate the number of grams of, what is that, ammonium nitrate needed to make 150 milliliters of a two molar solution. Okay, so this one is not as easy because it's asking us for grams. We can use the molarity equation to find moles and then use the molar mass to find grams. So this isn't as easy as the last two. So I'm going to start with my volume. So 0 0.15 liters. Okay. If it's a two molar solution, that means in one liter there are two moles. I would need to look up the molar mass of ammonium nitrate. So in one mole of ammonium nitrate, we have 80.06 grams. So put this in our calculator. Again, I recommend doing it a step at a time. So I would do 0.15 times two, 
and then times 80.06. And if I do that, sig fig wise, you should get about 24 grams. All right, calculate the molarity of a solution containing 50 grams of sodium, I believe that's carbonate, in 450 milliliter solution. Okay, so this time we've got grams and volume and we need to find the molarity. Okay, so let's see, we've got 50 grams. I would need the molar mass to go to moles. So the molar mass of our sodium carbonate is 105.99 grams. That's how many grams are in one mole. We're trying to find the molarity here. So I'm just gonna get the moles. So 0 0.472 moles. I know the volume, the volume is 450 milliliters. So I'm just gonna use the molarity equation here. Again, molarity is moles over liters. Our moles are 0 0.472 moles. And my volume, 450 milliliters, so just divide that by 1,000, 0 0.450 liters. And you get a nice round 1.0 molar. Okay, next we're going to work through some dilution problems. So for dilution problems, we're going to use the equation M1V1 equals M2V2. Okay. Um, be careful when you do these problems. You want to make sure that you group things together. Okay, so usually the numbers that are right next to each other are the numbers you're going to group together. When it talks about a stock solution, stock solution is our super concentrated solution. And if we're diluting it, that means we're taking our stock solution, we're gonna take a little bit of the stock solution, and we're gonna add some water to dilute it. So we go from concentrated to less concentrated. Okay, so that's what we're doing in a dilution. Okay, so um, another thing that you need to remember when you do dilutions, um, the volumes need to be the same. So it's okay to use milliliters here, as long as you have milliliters on both sides, okay? If it is um, in liters, you need to use liters on both sides. Okay, so just make sure when you're doing this, the volume is the same on both sides. So 775 milliliters and 2.75 molar go together. Okay, that's our dilute solution. So I'm gonna take our stock solution, so 12 molar. Oops, why am I drawing a box around that? That's not the answer, 12 molar. Um, we don't know the volume, so I'm going to just use X. And then on the other side, we have 2.75 molar and 775 milliliters. So I would multiply the right side together and then divide by the 12. So um, let's see, it would be X equals 2.75 times... 775, and then I would divide that by 12. When you put this in your calculator, make sure that you're using parentheses if you do it all as one calculation so that you get the right answer. And when I do this, I get 178 milliliters. So I'm only using 178 milliliters of my really concentrated solution, and then I'm adding a bunch of water to get it to 775 milliliters, and that's gonna drop our concentration, um, our molarity from 12 molar to 2.75 molar. Okay, so that's what we're doing with the dilution. All right, 
will be the final concentration of 250 milliliters of solution containing 15 milliliters of six molar stock um, NaOH solution. So again, these two numbers are going to go together, and then 250 will be by itself. So again, we're using the equation M1V1 equals M2V2. So we have a six molar stock solution. We're using 15 milliliters. Okay, we're going to dilute it out. We don't know the concentration, but we know that we're going to have 250 uh, milliliters. Okay, so when we multiply and divide, you should get an answer of 0 0.36 molar. Okay, what is the concentration in parts per million if 7.17 grams of sucrose is dissolved in 200 grams of solution? Okay, so for parts per million, it's um, mass of solute over mass of solution. And then we just multiply that by a million. So mass of our solute is 0 0.17 grams. Our solution is 200 grams. And then we multiply that by a million. So you should get 800 and 50, and our units for parts per million are just parts per million, PPM. Okay, the concentration of sugar in a soft drink is measured to be 10.5%. How many grams of sugar are in 125 grams of the drink? So mass percent is what we're looking for here. And mass percent is very similar to parts per million. It's mass of solute over mass of solution. And since it's a percent, we're just going to multiply this by 100. Our solute is, oh, wait a second. This one's not as straightforward. This time they're giving us the percent. So we know it's going to be 10.5%. Okay. And we know that the mass of the solute is unknown. It's 125 grams. And don't forget, multiply by 100. So let's start by dividing both sides by 100. And that'll get us 0 0.105 equals x over 125. Multiply both sides by 125, and you get x is equal to 13.1 grams. So for parts per million, mass percent, um, volume percent, it's always going to be volume of your solute or mass of your solute over the volume or mass of your solution and then it's going to be multiplied by a number. If it's a percent, you multiply by 100. If it's parts per million, you multiply it by a million. Okay, so one more. What is the percent by volume of a solution formed by mixing 100, or sorry, 25 milliliters of isopropanol with 45 milliliters of water? So just like I said, solute over solvent. Volume percent is going to be uh, not mass. Let's try that again. Volume of solute over volume of solution times 100. So 25 milliliters over 70 milliliters times 100. I get 36%.
All right, moving right along. I don't know about you. I don't know if you're having as much fun as I am. I'm having a blast doing this. All right, student collected the following data in the lab. Got a data table. It says, based on the data table, calculate the concentration of the unknown. Okay, so we don't know the concentration, but we do know the absorbance is 0 0.271. Okay, we want to pick points where that number falls between. If you look on the graph, sorry, if you look on the data table, our absorbance falls right between these two numbers right here. So we're going to find the slope of those points. Okay, our slope is going to be A over C. So we are going to do the second A point, so 0 0.309 minus 0 0.228, that's the first one, over 0 0.32, the concentration, the second point, minus 0 0.24, the first point, and I get 0 0.93625, that's going to be in our equation, that's going to be our epsilon. Okay, our unknown concentration It's going to be A equals epsilon LC. When you're working with this Beer's Law equation, your epsilon is your slope. So we found that. L, whoops, that's an E. Really should drink more coffee. L is equal to 1. C is going to be your concentration. and A is going to be your absorbance. So we're just gonna plug into our equation here. Um, we know the absorbance of our unknown is 0 0.271. We found our slope, which was 0 0.93625. L is always one and then we're solving for C. So I would multiply these two numbers together. It's pretty easy because any number times one is that number. And then I would divide 0 0.271 by that number. And you should get a concentration of 0 0.289. Our units for concentration are molarity, capital M. Okay, if 300 milliliters of a 0.5 molar stock solution of potassium chromate, maybe, is needed for this lab, calculate the amount needed to prepare it. So we're just making a stock solution here. Okay, so we got to convert this to liters. So that's going to be 0 0.3 liters. We know that we want a 0.5 molar solution. If it's 0.5 molar, that means in one liter, you have 0 0.5 moles. And we need the molar mass of potassium chromate in one mole. Molar mass, 194.2 grams. So again, I recommend doing these a step at a time when you put it in your calculator. I got 29 grams. Okay, calculate the amount of a 0.5 molar stock solution needed to make 250 milliliters of a 0.3 molar standard solution. Okay, this is just M1V1 equals M2V2, okay, because we're doing a dilution. These two numbers go together. This number's by itself. So we've got 0 0.3 molar, 250 milliliters. We're making 0 0.5 molar, or no, 0.5 molars are stock solution, and we don't know the volume. 
So if you solve correctly, you should get 150 milliliters. Okay, next question says, does, uh, describe the relationship between absorbance and transmittance. So let's go look at our data table up here. So we're missing the transmittance um, column, but we do have the absorbance column, and we have the molarity column. So molarity remembers our concentration. So let me just try to sketch this. So as our solution, or if our solution is really concentrated, so if our molarity is high, that means when we shine light through our solution, that not a lot's going to go through. Okay, so that means a lot is going to be absorbed. So our absorbance will be high. Our transmittance will be low. Transmittance is the amount of light that goes through our solution. Okay, so let me do another solution over here. So this will be a low molarity. So I pass my light through. So if molarity is low, that means our absorbance is going to be low and our transmittance will be high. Well, more light will pass through. Okay, so if you look here, absorbance and transmittance are opposites. So as one goes up, the other goes down. So we call that an indirect relationship. So again, as absorbance goes up, Transmittance goes down. As absorbance goes down, transmittance goes up. Okay, and again, absorbance is the amount of light that is absorbed that doesn't pass through. Transmittance is the amount of light that does make it through. Okay, considering the following graph, based on this information, what would be the absorbance for a solution that has a concentration of 0.365? molar. Okay, so 0.365 molar. Hmm, what do we know here? Well, we know that our slope, our epsilon, is absorbance over concentration. So this point is like right on the graph here. So when our absorbance is 50, our concentration is one. So we can say that our epsilon is 50. So we don't know the absorbance. The question is asking us to find the absorbance. We know the concentration is 0 0.365, L is one and epsilon is 50. So I would just punch this in my calculator and I would get an absorbance of 18.25. All right, now onto the fun stuff. Do some solution stoic. So much fun. All right, calculate the volume of two molar HNO3 solution required to react with 216 grams of silver according to the following equation. Okay, so you always start with grams, liters, milliliters, or moles. Okay, so moles and molarity are not the same thing. So we're going to start with our 216 grams of silver. Um, we can't do anything with grams. We need to convert it to moles. Okay, so I'm going to need the molar mass. That's how many grams are in one mole of silver. Okay, now we can do a mole ratio. So we're going from silver to HNO3. That looks like uh, three silver to four HNO3. So three moles silver to four moles HNO3.
And then it says we want a two molar solution. So that means we're going to have two moles. in one liter. Oops, HNO3. Again, when you're doing these problems, please, 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 please make sure that you are checking to your setup. So these problems will self-correct. So grams of silver, moles of silver, moles of HNO3, moles of HNO3. If you have it set up right, everything will cross off diagonal from each other. Okay, so when I put this in my calculator, I get 1.33 liters as my answer. All right, 21. Calculate the volume in milliliters of 0.5 molar NaOH needed to react with 3 grams of acetic acid. And then you've got your equation. Okay, so we don't start with molarity ever. Never do it. Start with grams milliliters, liters, or moles. Okay, so we've got three grams. Um, acetic acid is this mess right here. So HC2H3O2. Uh, can't do anything in grams, so we need to convert to moles. So 60.6 .6 grams is the molar mass of HC2H3O2. That's how many grams are in one mole. And we're going from that to NaOH. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. So even though it's gonna be one, I'm gonna write it down anyway, because then my units will cancel. Don't take shortcuts. Shortcuts cost you points. All right. And then finally, we know that we want a 0.5 molar solution. So that means there are going to be 0 0.5 moles in one liter. So I'll put this in my calculator. And I get 0 0.099 liters. Oh, but wait, it wants the volume in milliliters. So I'm just going to take that, multiply it by 1,000, and I get 99 milliliters. Okay, this last one is kind of a doozy because we've got a lot going on here. So it says 25 milliliters of 0.35 molar NaOH are added to 45 milliliters of 0.125 molar copper 2 sulfate. How many grams of copper 2 hydroxide will precipitate? So what we're going to do here, since we have two sets of volumes and molarity, we're going to do two stoic problems and we're looking for our limiting reactant. That's going to be our theoretical yield. So let's start with the sodium hydroxide. So we've got, let's see, 25 milliliters. There are 1,000 milliliters in one liter. Okay. Um, then we know... Since it's 0.35 molar, there are, in one liter, there are 0 0.35 moles of NaOH. Oh, and I was sloppy here. I forgot to put NaOH. I'm going to go back and do that. Just so excited about doing this problem that I, I forgot some stuff. All right. In our equation, going from... Um, sodium hydroxide to our copper 2 hydroxide, it's a 2 to 1 ratio. So for every 2 moles NaOH, we have 1 mole of copper 2 hydroxide. It's asking for grams. 
So for every one mole of copper to hydroxide, we're going to need the molar mass, which is 97.57 grams. So when I plug that in my calculator, carefully, I get 0 0.427 grams. We're going to do the same thing with our other numbers. So we're going to use our copper 2 sulfate. So we have 45 milliliters of that. Let's convert that to liters. It's going to be 0.125 molar, so that means for every one liter, we have 0 0.125 moles. Our moles ratio is 1 to 1 here. Our last step will be the same. So we're going to just find our moles of copper hydroxide. Which are 0 0.549 grams. Once we've run this two times, we look at our two answers. So we've got 0 0.427, 0 0.549. This is the smallest amount that we can make, so our final answer would be that, 0 0.427 grams. All right, moving on to the final three problems here. Okay, how many milliliters of 0.15 um, molar HCl is required to neutralize 2.75 grams of sodium carbonate according to the following equation. Okay, so this is going to be a titration problem. Titration problems have the word neutralize usually in them. Okay, so when we do a titration problem, we are going to um, look at what we're doing. So we've got HCl. That is our acid, and then sodium carbonate is our base. Okay, well, I lied. This isn't totally a titration problem. So we're going to start with our grams, because that's what we know the most about. So we've got 2.75 grams of sodium carbonate. Okay, so we got to convert this to moles first. So here's my molar mass. And that's how many grams are in one mole. Okay, let's go from base to acid. So one mole. Uh, to two moles of our acid. And then it says, let's see, we want, um, that's the molarity of our acid. So that means for every one mole of our acid, oh, sorry, not for every one mole, for our, every one liter of our acid, we have a molarity, we have 0.515 moles. And then it wants it in milliliters, so for every one liter of acid, we have a thousand milliliters. Okay. Punch this in our calculator, we get 101 milliliters. Okay.
how many grams of magnesium hydroxide will precipitate a 15 milliliters of 0.345 molar magnesium nitrate or combined with 25 milliliters of 0.230 molar potassium hydroxide according to the following equation. So we're going to need to run two solution stoic problems. So 15 milliliters magnesium nitrate is Mg and O3, 2. It is 0.345 molar, so that means, well, first of all, let's back up a second. We're in milliliters. We need to convert to liters. For every 1,000 milliliters of magnesium nitrate, you have one liter of magnesium nitrate. Now, let's use the molarity. So for every one liter of magnesium nitrate, you have 0 0.345 moles of magnesium nitrate. And it's asking us to look at how many grams of potassium hydroxide we're going to make. Or magnesium hydroxide. Okay, so um, it is a one to one ratio. So for every one mole, you have one mole. And it's asking for grams. So our last step every one mole of our magnesium hydroxide. Molar mass is 58.33 grams. So when I run the numbers here, I get 0 0.302 grams. We do the same thing with the other numbers. So this time we're going to do potassium hydroxide, which is, let's see, 25 milliliters. Convert that to a liters first. It is 0 0.230 molar. So that means for every liter of KOH, we're going to have 0 0.23 moles of KOH. And then we're going to do a uh, mole ratio. Uh, looks like it's two to one. So for every two moles, KOH, one mole of our magnesium hydroxide. Same steps going to, or the last step's going to be the same because we're just going to grams. So we get an answer of 0 0.168. We're going to use the smaller of the two numbers, which is 0 0.168, okay? Because KOH is our limiting reactant. Last problem. A student combined 60 milliliters of 0.322 molar potassium iodide with 20 milliliters of 0 0.530 molar lead to nitrate, according to the following reaction, how many grams of lead to iodide will precipitate? Same thing. We're going to run two different solution stoic problems. Potassium iodide is just Ki. Convert it to liters. It is uh, 0.322 molar, so that means for every one liter, 0 0.322 moles. This is a 2 to 1 ratio.
and then it's asking for grams. So for every one mole, we have 461 grams, that's the molar mass. So that is 4.45 grams. We just need to run this one more time using the other um, piece. So this time we're going from lead, uh, lead to nitrate to lead to iodide. So we've got 20 milliliters. Let's convert that to liters. Um, it is 0 0.530 molar, so that means in every one liter, we have 0 0.53 moles. And then we do our mole ratio. It's one to one. Last step's the same. Okay, when I do the numbers here, I get 4.89 grams. Comparing the two numbers, it looks like the first, 4.45, is smaller, so that would be our answer. That's it. That's the study guide.